Hi everyone, my name is Chris Sankaran, and today I'm going to be telling you about the stability of learned features. So in a nutshell, what I'm going to be talking about is a simulation on how do we bootstrap autoencoder models, right? And how do we understand the properties of the, the stability of the learned features across all those bootstraps? Um, but before diving into the simulation, I want to give a little bit of higher level motivation for why me, we might care about this in the first place. Um, and the, the goal of my study, I've been noticing lots of literature in science and in policy where people are starting with very complicated data sets and using automated algorithms to derive relevant features for downstream analysis. So uh, two examples of this. The first, Karen et al. They were looking at imagery of tumor uh, pathology slides, and they're able to see immune and tumor cells, uh, and they're able to link that to kind of usual genomic protein expression data, right? So in addition to the usual kind of X matrix of protein expressions, they're getting these imagery, and they're able to notice properties of these imagery, like the amount of mixing between the tumor and immune cells, which are very related to survival. Uh, and then the second example from Ye 2020, uh, this was an economic analysis where as a first step, they were able to take satellite imagery and figure out something like a wealth index just by looking at the imagery. And this wealth index is something that they would plug into the downstream economic analysis where usually it would have required some pretty complex uh, survey work on the ground, but now they just get it from the imagery directly. Right. So in both of these examples, there's this relatively complex non-tabular data where uh, features are being extracted semi-automatically, and then these features are used in all the downstream analysis. Right. So how do we understand the stability of those features? Uh, to begin to answer this, I'm going to design a very controlled experiment um, where I know everything about the generative process so that I can compare my generative process, the known features, with whatever these autoencoder models are learning. Right. So how do I generate images? I'm using a marked matern process. Um, so the top and the bottom, these are two examples of a marked matern process. Um, the one on the top, this is a very rough process. You can see the changes in the probability of the different cells as you go in different regions. The bottom one is a very smoothly varying one. You can tell that there's you know, a little bit more red on the top left than on the bottom right, um, but it's much smoother, right? And um, I can vary these sorts of parameters, right? The relative intensity of the different colors, the sizes of the cells, the temperature, which you use to choose the different marks. I can vary these sort of parameters in a very systematic way, um, and I can keep track of what they are, um, but then I can generate um, hundreds, thousands of these sorts of images, and I'm going to give you for analysis just the images and not the underlying generative parameters, right? So the question is, can you recover those features that I have um, that I use to generate everything? And when you use this feature learning algorithm, do you kind of stably recover the features that I know are there, right? Um, and to add an extra layer that's closer to what people might do in the real world, I'm adding a response. And the response variable associated with each image comes from some combination of the, uh, the underlying generative parameters. So um, if you're a scientist out there, you get a data set of these sort of images, what's the first thing you might do? Uh, you might train a, an autoencoder and learn some sort of embedding of all these imagery, right? So what I'm showing here, um, I've trained some 64 dimensional variational autoencoder. And I'm using this, uh, the resulting encodings to define a distance between the points. Uh, and then I can make a MDS projection of them. And th this is what you get. So there are 3000 images, each point is an image. To begin to interpret how the variation across the images looks like to this autoencoder, I can figure out you know, in each region of this MDS space, what are some representative images? And this is what you would get out, right? So uh, on the bottom, it looks like these are all the green cell images. On the top, there's all the blue cells. On the right, these are the ones with very few numbers of cells. 
Right? So it seems like the map that you get out of the honor coder, it's reasonable. This is why people are using it a lot. Um, but there's some subtleties, and I think this is what makes this analysis interesting. So um, some things about the features that are worth noting. Um, first of all, in kind of usual, especially with high dimensional statistics, what we're used to is um, each feature is relatively different from all the others. In fact, most of the features might not be relevant at all. But in the learned features here, they are all associated with some of the generative parameters. Right? And the other thing is they're, they're all pretty correlated with one another. So uh, here in the, I'm showing you a heat map of the correlation matrix between the learned and the true parameters. Right? So xn, this is the number of cells in each image. x nu, this is the true roughness of the underlying process. And each column is a different one of the learned features from one of my autoencoder runs. Right? And um, you can see kind of the, the correlation between the number of cells and each of these learned features is um, pretty high for a lot of them, right? So it's not like we have kind of isolated, disentangled information across the features. That's one point. Um, kind of the second thing to think about is, um, you know, we don't just run it once, right? We're interested in stability. So how are we going to assess stability? We run uh, here 60 bootstrap models on this same data set here, um, train a variational autoencoder from scratch each time, and we get a different feature embedding each time. Right, so here, the top and bottom, these are two heat maps of the correlation matrices from two different, um, two different one of these runs. Right? So the features are no longer, they don't correspond to one another. Right? So feature one in the first run doesn't have really anything to do with feature one in the second run. Right? So that's something that's a little bit different from standard statistical analysis or any kind of usual bootstrap. So how do you get around the fact that the features no longer correspond to one another? Uh, what I propose is you use some sort of um, multi-table canonical correlation analysis. Right? So this is the objective. What it's trying to do is it's trying to align the scores in some projected space so that uh, kind of the resulting features um, from all these different feature maps are going to be somehow aligned across all the bootstrap runs, right? And I'm showing you here is the RV coefficient. So the RV coefficient is a, a tabular generalization of the correlation coefficient. Um, you're able to see uh, this is kind of one very rough assessment of the stability across all the bootstrap runs. Um, and maybe the more interesting thing is now that you've aligned all the features, you can compute uh, stability paths, right? So this is kind of in the spirit of stability selection. So in stability selection, you have defined features in advance, and you look at the lasso trajectories across many subsamples of the features. Here, I'm looking at the lasso trajectories, but on the, the projected features, right? So I've aligned them using this canonical correlation procedure. Now I'm looking at the um, those kind of aligned features. What are their responses with my simulated Y? And you can get a, a sense where, okay, I might believe in the in feature six and feature seven being associated with the response more than feature two or feature three, right? And and you know the comparison with feature three I think is especially interesting because in some of the runs it does seem like it might be an important trajectory, um, but then when you compare it with the many other bootstrap replicates, it kind of you begin to think it's not so important actually. And more than just looking at the features, uh, you can also look at the projections, the scores, right? Um, so what I'm showing here, I've picked nine images, um, and I'm looking at the first two CCA directions. And for each of these nine images, I have 60 points, right? I have the 60 learned feature maps that I've projected down into this unified space, and I'm able to get uh, uncertainties on the representations for these images, right? And this is not something that you can get directly um, from typical autoencoder model. Right? Um, so the obvious downside to using this sort of work uh, is that running a kind of large number of bootstrap replicates on complicated 
uh, data using a VAE, this is going to be pretty computationally intensive, right? It sounds like maybe more trouble than it's worth, right? So we've explored a few different kinds of shortcuts. So what I'm showing you here is a shortcut that you can try to achieve using fine tuning. So the idea is you share the training for all the models. Um, you collapse it into one model for a while. So here are 10 epochs. You can share for 10 epochs the training. And then only after that, you allow them to separate, right? And the, the kind of intuition is that um, the longer that they're shared, then the more similar the resulting feature maps are going to be, right? And they're going to be more similar than if you had completely bootstrapped the entire process. But on the other hand, it's a much more efficient thing to do. So what this plot is showing you is um, as you try to be a little bit more and more computationally greedy, how much are you losing in terms of your faithfulness to the original bootstrap? Right? So as you go down, um, now it looks like uh, all the tables are going to be similar. This is not that surprising because um, you've already shared all the feature learning up to that point. And kind of this somewhat interesting thing is that this is happening relatively early on. Even 10 to 20 epochs in, it's now all your feature maps are going to be pretty similar downstream. Um, so this is my talk. Uh, here are some references you can see more. Um, I'm looking forward to discussing this work with all of you in the virtual conference. Uh, have a really nice day.